Uh, thank you very much, Anton. Uh, I uh, want to say something, and it's not just really because I feel that I should say it. Uh, it really comes from my heart. I feel humbled to be here. Uh, so many amazing speakers have spoken already today. Uh, and I was sitting there and thinking what they're saying is, is actually what I want to say. So let's take that out. Let's take that out. Let's take that out. And at the end, I thought there was nothing left for me to say. So I could really just say, you've heard it all. Let's go home. Um, but um, I, I do want to say that what I'm going to share, some of you have already heard and heard and heard and heard. So if you have listened to this specific presentation, you are welcome to get up and go home. I will not be angry, but I will be very hurt. And I will need counseling. Um, so if you have to listen to it again, then uh, it's not my fault, but it is their fault. And um, I had a, a life-changing, no, let's rather say, a mind-changing experience about five years ago. Uh, we had a Doxa Deo uh, conference in East Campus. And I remember Gerard van Krienen phoning me and saying to me, Alistair, we are going to have different speakers on different topics, and we'd like you to speak on passion. And, and for a moment I thought, well, that's easy. And then when I started thinking about it, I thought that could be quite a difficult topic to cover. But Harad sent me a DVD. And he said, we'd like you to use this DVD as the start of your presentation. That was five years ago. I've spoken on this train issue. And you heard just now when Sister Kate spoke, she said uh, something about a train. I've spoken on this a m number of times, and every time it just blesses my heart. I hope that it's going to just add to, to what everybody has said already today, and you'll go home with this question. And I want you to start by just watching this DVD
For God so loved the world. God so much compassion for the people on his train. The question, however, is who is on your train? And this question really hit me right there, but it didn't only hit me there, it hit me right here. Because you see, every one of us here tonight have a train. And there are people on your train. And I don't like thinking about that, but I'm turning 65 this year. And in these 65 years, I've had a train. And there have been people on my train. And when it becomes, who's on my train, then it actually says, but if I ask the question, who's on my train, it becomes my responses that are under the spotlight. It becomes my choices. People spoke a lot today about choices and what your choices mean to you as an individual. But do you know that your choices impact on the people on your train? My choices, my decisions. But also we saw that, that guy on the, on the video clip and we saw that he had to sacrifice. His choice led to sacrifice because it was his responsibility. And after what we've heard today, and I must say, I was... And there's a beautiful Afrikaans word that really has, Joanne, it has that sound that you struggle with, okay? I was rude today, okay? Thank you. But you see, and, and Alan Platt very often speaks about this. He says, it takes a choice for us to move from being rude because it concerns us. Concerns us when we listen to Stan. It concerns us when we listen to Heike. But Alan says what we really need to do is to move from concern to compassion. And if you think about your train tonight, And you think about the question, who's on your train? Maybe you should take a walk down the corridors of your train. Because there are certain carriages of our train that we like walking in. There are certain carriages that carry people that I like remembering they're on my train. But there are certain carriages that I'd like to unhook and leave them somewhere. <laughs> we had that happen here a few years ago. Uh, the Rovos Rail comes past here and the blue train every day almost. But the Rovos Rail was unhooked from the, the uh, electric motor uh, the, um, the electric engine and they put on we're going to put on a steam locomotive but before they put on the steam locomotive the carriages started moving from centurion here and they crashed here near pop-up and it was chaos i want to say if you unhook a few of your carriages tonight you're going to cause chaos you would like to 
you would like to. And you would like, and, and we had a few speakers say today, there are people on your train, there are people that are on my train that I'd like to wish away. But when they got on, they got on. They're there. They're there. And the question tonight is, who is on my train? And, and it, we really, really need to think tonight, why am I here? And Ruan, he, he used a, 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 a sentence that I use almost regularly here at Pop-Up. I ask the learners, why are you here? Why, why are you alive? And you, you know when you suddenly ask somebody, why are you alive? They, they sort of say, uh, just let me think about that. Ruan said he knows he's alive, not because his parents had sex. I like telling this story. You've all heard it many times. But my mother and father were 47. No children. My mother got sick. She thought she had a stomach virus. She went to the doctor and she said, Doctor, I've got a virus in my stomach. And the doctor said, Mrs. Westcott, I think, let me examine you. He examined her, asked a few leading questions, and he said, uh, I think you must sit down. And she said, why am I going to die? He said, no, you're not going to die. Your stomach virus is going to take seven months. You're two months pregnant. And here tonight, in front of you, is my mother's virus. So why am I here? Not because Harold and Joey were having sex. They were doing that quite a long time. But I'm here because on the 24th of June, 1951, on a Tuesday evening at 10 to 11 in the St. Augustine's Hospital in KwaZulu-Natal, Durban, a train left the station. Me. You can think of where you left the station for the first time, but that's not really important. It's who got on your train since it's left the station. And, and a few people tonight, the, today have said, this is not, please people, this is not to make you feel guilty. This is to, to move your heart to compassion. Because Jesus said, in, and in the Message Bible, it's so amazing. Um, Alan taught us when, uh, uh, when, we, when I was a campus pastor here in inner city, he said, campus pastors, make sure if you have a visiting preacher that you have a sermon nearby. Because if the preacher doesn't pitch, you've got to preach. And that happened one night at ICC. The preacher didn't pitch and I let the worship leader sing. And uh, I let him sing. And I let him sing. And then I decided to pick up the message Bible. And I opened it to this verse. And look at that first sentence. Let me tell you why you are here. You are here because people are going to get on your train. The reason why I am here and why you are here, and people will say to serve God, to serve God in what way? To serve God in reaching, touching, healing, uplifting the people on your train. The ones you like, the ones you love, and the ones you don't like at all. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? God is not a secret to be kept. Be generous with your lives. And I, I, I could speak for three hours on this. Unfortunately, Ruan only gave me two hours tonight. 
So I would like us to move on to the next one. And uh, I'm not going to read that. But one of the verses in the Bible which should have an impact on each one of us when we think about who's on my train, it's Philippians 2 verse 5. It's in the Bible, guys. It's there. Whether we live in South Africa or Russia, whether we drive on the American roads or on the South African roads with our taxis, in the Bible it says, let the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Not when I like it. Always. Not where I like it. Always. And, and I'd like to just quickly speak about, I think, one of the most important words should be in our vocabulary as a Christian. Attitude. And we don't buy an attitude from pick and pay. We don't get an attitude when we study at university. No, we don't even get an attitude when we become a member of a church. And can I say something? And you might think this is very strange, but it's true. We don't even get an attitude when we become Christians and children of God. Because you can stand on your knees and pray until you are blue in the face. God, give me the right attitude. Oh, God. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, get up and choose the right attitude. And I, I think it's on the next slide. There's a, a rem no, go to the next one. Thank you. There's a remark at the bottom made by Gandhi. It's the saddest remark I've ever read in my life. If all the Christians in the world were more like the Jesus they tell us about, the whole world would be Christians. Without a sermon, without an evangelization campaign, the whole world would be Christians if we choose the right attitude. Now, think about the question again. Who is on your train? Because the person on your train is there. Because he should, she should experience your attitude. And my attitude, I choose even when I'm driving. I have a big problem with that. And I've been speaking and talking to myself almost every day because I drive through the inner city of Pretoria to get to pop-up, and I have to drive through the inner city to get home again. And I can say to you with, 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 with a realization that it's true that the taxis make me angry. But once again, I think of something that Duncan's father told us many years ago. He said, if I, Eben, spit in your face, do I make you angry? No, I make you wet. You choose to be angry. And I want to say to you today, the people on your train don't make you be the attitude that you choose. Actually, I should say me, because I can't preach to you tonight. I'm talking to you. The way this thing impacted me five years ago. Who, Alistair, is on your train? On my train. My brother-in-law is on my train. I don't, I don't think if he wasn't married to my wife's sister, he would have come near my train. But he's there. 
I dedicated a baby a few years ago of a couple that I married. And, and as the people came in, I noticed this very weird person. He was dressed in black. He almost looked like Lever Haxi, but he actually looked a bit more Haxerig than she did. He had rings on every finger. There were rings through every part of his face and around his head that you could possibly imagine. And I looked at him and I thought, wow, you're weird. After the service, who should come to me but weirdo? And he puts out one of those hands with all the rings on and he says, hi, my name's Tim. And I thought, really? (laughs) But you know what? At that moment, he put his foot into my train. I would never have invited. Because you see, the people on your train did not get a written email, SMS, or WhatsApp message to invite them onto your train. They're there. And he took my hand and he said to me, Hi, my name's Tim. I come from India. I thought, that's strange. You're not an Indian. He said, I moved to India because I believe that's where I lived in my previous life. (laughs) And I really would have said to the driver of my train, stop. I I want to, to get somebody off my train, you know. And he held my hand and he looked into my eyes and he said, I would just like to say to you, I don't really believe in God. But I felt a movement in my heart while you were talking. And I mean, I dedicated a baby. It wasn't a sermon of salvation. I never saw Tim again. But for that moment, he was on my train. Some people are on your train for 65 years. Some people for two minutes. But the question tonight is, who is on your train? And I would like to just mention something to you. Yeah, yeah, come on, die volgende in. Um, I have three train attitudes, but I'm not going to talk about all three of them. I just want to talk about one. You can invite me back for the other two. Because I'm actually enjoying myself now. Ryan. You know, if you walk around on your train, there are three attitudes that I think you should choose. Okay? Nobody's going to give it to you. And the first one, yeah, yeah, come on is the one meter attitude. I'd like to explain this by telling you a little story. It's about an old age home, or what do we call them nowadays? A retirement village. Sounds better to me at my age. Um, A retirement village. And, and the, the elderly people were living there, and right across the road, there was a beautiful park filled with the most beautiful gardens and, and streams of water and, and birds, and, and it was just amazing. Every day at 11 o'clock when they'd had their tea, they would all shuffle across the road to this park and just sit there and enjoy the peace in this park. And then one day they were all sitting there and down in the bottom gate of the park entered a young man with his four children. He sat on the bench and his four children did what children do in a park. They ran everywhere. 
They splashed in every part of a water that you could think of. They climbed in the trees and broke the branches. They picked flowers and played sword fights with the flowers and the roses. And the old people were sitting there and they were saying to themselves, an on star. <laughs> Joanne, that means in our days. And they were sharing with each other what they would do to those four naughty brats. Until one old man got up and he went, and I won't do it, all the way down to the bench where the young man was sitting. And he sat down next to him and he looked at him and he said, young man, I just want to tell you, we come here every day and it's wonderful to be here. But today it's terrible and it's terrible because of your children. Can't you do something to your children? They're breaking this park apart. And the young man turned his face to the old man. And for the first time, the old man saw the tears running down his face. And he looked at him and he said to him, Sir, in Afrikaans he would have said, Wim. Sir, I'm sorry. Any other day, I would have disciplined them. But sir, I have to take them home now and tell them that their mother died this morning. It was only when he chose to move closer that he heard the story. It was only when he chose to move closer that he saw the tears. How close was he? One meter away. Eli is in the temple. And he sees Hannah coming into the temple. And she's crying down in the bottom of, at the back of the temple. And he says, that woman is drunk. And it's so early in the morning. And he goes to her, ready to rebuke her. And she tells him a story that moves his heart. But he would never have heard that story if he wasn't one meter away. Who was it? Was it Yanni or somebody that spoke about the lepers? Was it you, Yanni? Jesus heals the leper. Jesus had the power to stand as far as Nerissa is from me and say, be healed. And he would have been healed. But Jesus chooses a one meter attitude and he walks up to the leper and he touches him. How far is that? You want to touch a leper on your train? No. But maybe that's exactly what you should do. I want to say this, and I say it with, with deep, deep affection for the church where I've been part of for the last 18 years. And before that, for the last 36 years in ministry, but unfortunately, one of the most judgmental places on this earth is the church. And you know why? Because we don't see the tears. And we don't hear the stories because we're too far away. Have you ever been in that carriage on your train? Or do you simply choose to miss it. I'm talking to me. 
I had an experience once, and I'd like to close with this. I'd like the focus to be on Colin and not on me. It was just by, no, I wanted to say by chance. It was on my train. I was the campus pastor of North Campus of Doxadeo. And we used to have services at Port Prison. It was great. People in the prison are the most amazing people to preach to because they are so receptive of what you're saying. And it was such an amazing service. And I was full of the joys of being a pastor who just preached an amazing sermon. And I walked out and the prison warden said to me, Pastor, would you mind coming and praying for the people in the hospital at the prison? And I said, no, sure. Again, most fun hospital besoek. Been doing it all my life. You just need your Bible under your arm. Yanni, you have it most name. And um, and I'm a pastor. Why would I have a problem with going to pray for the people in the hospital ward? So I walked with the warden and she, she sort of guided me in at the door. And when I got in the door, I stopped dead. I don't think I had ever seen so many people so sick and die. And I, I looked around. And, and she sort of thought she would, she would calm me. And she said, Pastor, most of them have AIDS. <gasps> it was even worse. And I looked at the person right at the door. I think they had him there because the next move would be out. <laughs> and I, I, looked in, I looked into this ward and I thought, Alistair... Don't worry, you can just stand right here and pray. They'll all hear you, even if they're in a coma. <laughs> and God sort of said to me in my heart, look at the one right here at the door. And I looked. And you know what? Suddenly, there was a guy on my train who looked like a skeleton. And that skeleton was covered in sores. And out of that skeleton's mouth, there was like white foam. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll pray for him specially, Lord. So I sort of stood around and I, I looked at him and I, I, I said, he's big eyes he looked up at me and I said hi and for a moment I wanted to ask him how are you and then I thought that would be stupid and I said my name's Alistair what's your name and he said one word Colin and Colin got onto my train And I said, Colin, I'd like to pray for you. And clearly in my heart, I heard God say to me, he doesn't need a prayer right now. I thought, well, what does he need then? And God said to me, touch him. He hasn't had anybody touch him for months without gloves. I'd like to say to you today, there are people you don't want to touch, but they're on your train. And um, I sort of used the tips of my finger. And I 
put out my hand and I touched him. And God said, touch him properly. Uh, And I thought, well, okay, I can wash my hand again afterwards. So I, I put my hand on Colin's shoulder. And God spoke to me again. And he said, with this one, one meter is not close enough. I am a hugging person, you know that. But I didn't really want to hug him. But I did get down on my knees next to that bed. And I did put my hands around him. And all I could think of was to sing. And Vilma, that's my wife. She says, that's enough to kill anybody. (laughs) (laughs) But I did start singing. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And two big tears came down Colin's cheeks. Everyone to him belongs. You are weak, Colin, but he is strong, yes. My Jesus loves you. And the words you have on your notes became true to me because Jesus wasn't there to touch him. He needed my hands to do that. Jesus wasn't there to hug him. He needed my arms to do that. There are people on your train with the most basic needs that you could ever think of. And they're on your train. You know what's the saddest thing? That the people who are closest to us Sleeping right next to me in my bed. Sometimes need just that. And I'm too busy to do that. I phoned the next morning. And I said, I'm Alistair. I'd just like to find out how Colin is. And they said, soon after you left, he passed away. You see, I couldn't make an appointment to give him a hug. It would have been too late. I'm finished. I'm asking you. Who is on your train? Could we just close our eyes for a moment? And what I ask now, Holy Spirit, is that you would give us a clear, clear insight into every coach on our train. Maybe there's somebody sitting here and you know tomorrow 
you have to go to that coach and do something there. Father God, I, I don't pray for these people. I pray for us. We're not here because Life Work Leadership had a, 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 a date for us to be here today. We're here because your Holy Spirit wanted to remind us that we're, we're here on earth to make a difference. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would become a reality in our hearts and in our lives that would call us to a stop every day. And we know that we choose the attitude of Jesus because that will change this world. Please help us, Holy Spirit. Please.